breaker, anti-apartheid activist, one of the world's preeminent jurists of the status of judge, a legal rock star. The Cairo Women's Forum is very proud to host today Dr. Navi Pillay, the former United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. Let's find out more about her. In 1914s, South Africa wasn't an easy place for young black women. Racial segregation was a stark reality of everyday life. Pele was born on the 23rd September 1941 in the poor community of Clairwood in Durban to a humble Indian family in apartheid South Africa. Girls weren't expected to get any education, but she refused to be defined by her circumstances. She faced huge obstacles and she successfully boxed away many firsts. To start, she was the first black woman to enter Harvard Law School, where she received both master degree and doctorate in law. In 1967, she was the first woman to set up her own law practice in Natal province in South Africa. During 28 years, she acted as a defense attorney for anti-apartheid activists, exposing torture and helping establish key rights for prisoners. In 1995, after the hand of apartheid, Nelson Mandela nominated Navy Pillay as the first non-white woman to serve as a judge on the High Court in South Africa. The same year, she was elected by the United Nations to be a judge at the International Criminal Tribunal for Wenda, where, for the first four years, she was the only woman to serve on the panel. She later became the president of that committee. Then, in 2003, she was elected by the United Nations as a judge on the International Criminal Court, a post she held until 2008 when she was confirmed as High Commissioner for Human Rights by Ben Ki-moon, the UN Secretary General. She is today the new president of Advisory Council of the International Nuremberg Principles Academy. Among other worlds, she is the co-founder of Equality Now, an international women's rights organization. As trailblazer, as one of those women who broke every boundary, every barrier, not just for herself, but for women in South Africa, for women of color, for women around the world. We would like to invite Dr. Navy Pillay to share with us her successful path as a mother, a daughter, a wife, a woman, a remarkable leader, and her thinkings about solidarity. Pillay Navy, we are very glad to host you today for the interview on behalf of the, the Career Women Forum. We celebrate this year our 40 years and we interview 40 women for this 40 years. And it's a real honor to interview the world preeminent judge of the world, Dr. Pillay. How could you describe yourself with your words? Well, firstly, let me say congratulations to the Career Women's Forum. It's such an excellent idea 
to promote women and also to hear of the challenges and achievements. Wherever I go in the world, you know, truly young women come up to me and say, you inspire us. Now, you don't think that when you start a job or you're working very hard at it. But now I'm older. And as I look back, I realize, yes, we have to uh, have solidarity amongst women, even the young ones who are still starting, in order to encourage them. So a little bit about myself. I held the position of judge and president of the UN Tribunal for Rwanda. And when I was um, nominated by President Mandela and elected by the GA, I thought I'll just go for one year and come back because I, I come from a big city and, and I didn't want to go to Tanzania for too long. So I thought I'm resigning after one year and even though we had lack of resources and many, many challenges, I stayed on for eight and a half years. Why? Because the women witnesses who described horrendous rape, sexual violence and killings said to me and my two judicial colleagues, we waited for this day to see justice being done. So that's the larger need out there. And you don't at that time think about yourself. So after me serving on that tribunal, I was elected to the, the world's first permanent international criminal court. That's the International Criminal Court in The Hague. And I had served five and a half years there on the appeals division when I was headhunted, interviewed by the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and he asked me to resign as a judge and take up this position. That was not easy for me because no judge likes to retire. But once again, it was a, a different job. It meant advocacy rather than being judgmental. So those were my three international positions. You know, even there you have to be support dominated by human rights organizations and law organizations in your country in order to get a position like that. I uh, served for six years. I was the only high commissioner who had extended term. So instead of four years, I served six years. And now I retired in 2014, but I am now serving as the chair of the Commission of Inquiry into Israel and and. Uh, Palestine, set up by the Human Rights Council. I am a judge ad hoc in the International Court of Justice, and I'm the president of the International Coalition Against the Death Penalty. I'm also the president of the Advisory Council of the Nuremberg Principles Academy. So as you can see, I, I haven't stopped. I'm continuing with my work because the message I get from other women is, if you are able and and uh, can contribute, you should be willing to do so. All your life you serve the human rights. What are the reasons that motivate you to get so involved in this field? Well, I, uh, I grew up uh, in apartheid South Africa, you know, where we people of color were treated like dirt. I'm actually the grandchild of a laborer who was brought by the British from India to work on the sugarcane plantations. And Mahatma Gandhi called those conditions semi-slavery. And so my parents were born in South Africa, but we were never given citizenship until late 1960s. We never had the vote. So it's the first time we voted is when Nelson Mandela headed the new democratic government. It's the first time my 95 year old father voted as well. So when you grow up under apartheid, you see suffering and injustice and you get motivated to do something about that. Now I had the opportunity to do that kind of work internationally to benefit victims all over the world. You know, they say the High Commissioner for Human Rights is the voice for victims. Uh, and so, you know, I don't even think twice. I served as a lawyer for 30 years here in South Africa, 
taking on the cases of the poor, the disadvantaged, and those who were being victimized politically, but mainly cases of women who were being uh, abused or battered in their homes. At first, as a young lawyer, I had very little patience for the women who come and cry in front of me. Well, I did not experience what they've experienced. And they said to me, we've come to you because you're a woman and you will understand. And that opened my eyes, not to be an arrogant lawyer, but to see how I could best serve them. So human rights. Thank you very much. If you could, what would you do differently today? You know, I hear so many people, including ministers and, and, and really top people saying they wish they had my job. So it's very unique. It has a lot of power. If you can have the leverage to make change for good, then I was put, I was obviously holding the right office. So I wouldn't do anything differently except to say we all obviously want to do a better job and to improve Uh, whatever we can. And sometimes when um, our staff were killed, the human rights people were killed, or um, activists, for instance, on LGBTI rights, when, when one of them was killed, and that would just shake me so much. Couldn't we have done more to protect them? What is the best advice you received and the best advice you could provide to women who would like to develop professionally? Well, firstly, the best advice would be personal. I have two daughters and they were going to university at the time when I had to leave them and take up this position. And so I discussed it with them and they encouraged me. Yes, go mom. So that was very good advice from them. Uh, I would say to all women, um, you will face many challenges. Nothing is easy in life. You have to work very hard. In fact, all the other judges elected me president, and one of them told me it's because we know that your women work very hard. Now, it shouldn't be like that. It's, you know, we do not need to have to work harder than the men to get promotions and so on. But in the reality is uh, you establish your mark by producing the best results. Regarding the solidarity, how does the word solidarity resonate with you? What does it evoke to you? You know, solidarity is cooperation to achieve your common goals. If you don't have solidarity and say women Uh, say spiteful things again about each other, discourage other women. How often have we heard women say, oh, she, she got that promotion because she must have slept her way through. So I often feel women have to change their attitudes, support other women and act in solidarity to make a better world for for the younger girls and for the next generation. So solidarity is cooperation. We cannot have a successful multilateral system unless there's full cooperation all sides. I'll tell you, Jamila, what uh, comes to my mind when you mention solidarity. I, rec I attended the Beijing Fourth World Conference for Women in 1994. And what we learned from other women there is uh, where they said, if you have risen up, then leave that ladder for the next woman to climb up. So that's one of your obligations. And the other is, if you clap with one hand, how much sound can you make? Nothing. Nobody will hear you. But if you act in solidarity with all women, yeah, then that's a much louder voice louder protest that cannot go unnoticed. I think uh, that that was my job both as lawyer, judge and High Commissioner for Human Rights, the importance of cooperation and solidarity with others with, with the same interest. 
in the career women forum we are convinced that we are going to change or continue to change the world with men but how can women engage further to support each other and in which area if you have an opinion about that you have to continue to be active if you turn your back and you don't notice then discrimination against women will continue where is it most evident you know in every crisis whether it's floods or covid or ebola the un documents that it's a uh, women who suffer the most they lose their job they at the bottom of the uh, ladder in terms of receiving aid and so on they're not taken seriously if you look around even amongst professionals the senior management is always white and male and not women but things are changing and sometimes quite fast i remember that in in my time uh, the secretary general ban ki moon appointed 12 women as usgs you know heads of departments and missions where previously they had always been occupied by men so that's how change starts and we can't give up and say oh everything is against us um i do admire women activists all over the world who demand change demand it as their right and an indiscreet question your daughter are going to continue in a certain way your action or they are in another field <laughs> they activists they feminists you know i look around and look at the young people they don't have to go through what my generation did you know my generation was forced into early marriages i was in primary school when when the parents pulled out my friends and got them married before they turned 15 they had no say but today you have to consult uh, the girls and women because they know their rights they speak up for their rights so uh, our efforts creates a better world a more equal world for women and girls and their efforts will take us even further because they have special tools they have the internet they have social media they can communicate their messages to millions of people so i see a lot of hope in what women and girls can achieve by getting together thank you very much for your time for this interview so inspiring for not only the women of the career women forum and thank you very much for doing this thank you for your probing questions thank you so much okay thank Bye. you thank you very much thank bye you. bye, <laughs> bye.